All right, well, uh, I know that was a little bit longer than normal, but a normal video, but I think it's important, especially with what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and today, uh, we are going to be starting a new journey into the New Testament. For the last year and a half, we have been going through the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to uh, Malachi, all right? And now we are going to move into um, the New Testament. So today, we are going to be not only introducing you to the New Testament, but we're going to be talking about several very important and difficult um, items to understand from the Bible. So if you take notes or like to take notes uh, or don't take notes, but you want to remember this, this would be the time that you use those handout sheets that you take notes as we go along because we are going to give you a lot of information. And so I would also ask that in order to help you guys follow along, that especially tonight, you just pay attention, all right? Don't talk to your neighbors. Don't look at your phones. Just listen in because what we're going to talk about tonight can literally change your life, all right? So... We are moving into the New Testament. We are going to start in the Gospels, and we are going to uh, be looking at the life of Jesus over the next few weeks. Now, here's the deal. The Gospels are four different books written from four different perspectives, okay? And this is on your handout. Four different uh, books written from four different perspectives, all right? And they'll give pencils to you. Just keep your hands raised. They'll get them here as quick to you as quick as they can. All right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the four Gospels. Okay? And each of them wrote with a different purpose. All right? Matthew wrote to show us that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Mark wrote to support the current believers, those both Jew and Gentile that had come to love and trust Jesus as their Savior. Uh, Luke um, wrote so that we could be amazed at who Jesus is and his life, and he focused on the details of everything, all right? John wrote to show us that Jesus was the Son of God. And so those four guys look out... Failure. Epic failure. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. Come on, Brandon. It's all right, guys. So all four of them, all four of them um, wrote the gospel with their own perspective. And like we saw in the video, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, like we said in the video, or we saw in the video, that doesn't mean that they're um, uh, that they have error in them or that they're unreliable. It gives us a better picture of what is going on and what is happening. Okay, so you take all of these four eyewitnesses of who Jesus is, and they each give you a story in a different part of the story and add to it or have a different perspective on it. And what it does is it comes to a point where you can see the whole story. And it gives you a complete and total picture of who Jesus is and what he is about and how he lived his life. So that's why there's four Gospels. There's not just one. There's four of them. So we can get the complete and whole picture of who Jesus is. As we go through the life of Jesus, we're mainly going to be following through the, um, uh, the book of Luke. We will jump to Matthew. We will jump to Mark. Um, but mostly we're going to stay in the book of Luke. Okay? Um, but something else happens. Other than us transitioning to the Gospels uh, from the Old to the New Testament, something else happens from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You see, the Old Testament... Focused on the curse, all right? Focused on the curse that came from Adam. And that curse is sin. And as we went through the Old Testament, we saw how sin affected the Israelites in the world and how that affected their relationship with God. But now in the New Testament, we're no longer going to be focused on the, the, the curse or sin per se, we're going to be focused on the remedy for sin, 
All right? And that is the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, sin, I'm going to scoot this forward so I can get eliminated here in a second. All right? Sin literally means missing the mark. It's an archery term. All right? And if you were at winter camp, you had an opportunity to shoot me with a bow and arrow. Only one person was successful, and that was because I was distracted. Um, but that's okay. Um, and so uh, you had the opportunity to shoot a bow and arrow. So when you're practicing archery, if you were to aim at the target, look at the bullseye, and you were to shoot and miss the bullseye, it would be called sin. All right? And they would mark it down as a sin and put your score down. But here's the deal. While we call it sin, that, that's a very good representation of it. But the truth is, when we're talking about biblical sin, all right, we're not even aiming at the right target. Not only did we miss the mark, but we're aiming at the opposite target. Because here's the deal. God is holy. God is perfect. He is mighty, and he is righteous. And if we're shooting at that target and missing, we can't even hit that target. Because in order to land on that target, you have to be holy. You have to be perfect. You have to be righteous. So when we're aiming and we sin, we're not even aiming at the right target. But Jesus came to change that. He came to take us from shooting at the wrong target to aiming and shooting at the right target and hitting the bullseye every time. So here's what we need to understand. Sin is missing the mark. But sin is not something that's simple. All right? And we're going to talk a lot about sin tonight and what exactly it is. And then we're going to talk about the remedy for sin. All right? But here's the first thing you need to know. The first faith lesson I want us to bring tonight is this. It's okay. I thought it was mine. That's my wife's ringtone. So just hold it for the one. Um, um, so let me check my phone, make sure it's on silent. That'd be good. Um, so. The first faith lesson for tonight that we need to take from that is this. Sin is a deadly disease. All right? I want to repeat that. Sin is a deadly disease. But here's the problem. We treat sin like it's the common cold. Well, if I, if I go by somebody that was sick... Um, then all I need to do is wash my hands or use some hand sanitizer and I'll be clean. Or I'll just stay away from everybody that's sick altogether. I wish that my parents would have let me go. Mom, like everybody's sick at school and I'm not, so can I just stay home? But she never did. And I tried all the time, but she never let that happen. But wouldn't that be great? Hey, the kids at school are sick. Can't I stay home and take a sick day? Even though I'm not sick? I don't need to get sick when I'm in. But... We treat sin like that. We look at it and we go, look, if I just keep the Ten Commandments, if I just do what it says, if I protect myself, if I don't go out, if I don't do anything, then I can be safe and I can protect myself from sin. But here's the problem. Sin is an inherited, life-threatening disease. Sin is an inherited, life-threatening disease. It is something we are born with. It is something that we have. And there's nothing on this earth that we can do to avoid it. It is there from all time. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 14 says this, and it illustrates it for us. And this is going to be our main text. So if you have your Bible, you can flip to Romans chapter 5, and we will be there for most of the night. Verse 12 of chapter 5 says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all men, because all sinned. In fact, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigns from Adam to Moses, and even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgressions, because he is a prototype of the coming one. So when Adam, all the way back in Genesis 3, took the fruit and he took a bite of it, he sinned. And in doing so, he separated himself from God, and death entered the world to rule over all of us. And it is through Adam and 
as the head of mankind, it is inherited by each and every single one of us. All right? And we all experience a spiritual death, and we all will experience a physical death. The spiritual death happened all the way back in Genesis 3. We were separated from God, and when we are born, we are spiritually dead. All right? We are not connected to God. And as we live our lives, as things happen, we will eventually have, end up in a physical death. And those two things are going to happen to every single one of us. But here's the deal. Like I said, it's inherited. It is not. It is not tied to the law. A lot of us think that if we keep the Ten Commandments, if we keep the laws of God, then we can be saved, right? That'll be good. But here's the deal. You can't earn your way to salvation. If law, if sin was tied to law, and when we sin, we uh, uh, face a spiritual and a physical death, then little newborn babies who are fresh out of the womb would never pass away. Little unborn babies who have never sinned, never even taken a breath of air, would not pass away because they would not experience physical death because they have not sinned. So sin is not tied to the law. It's not tied to keeping and doing good things. It's not tied um, to being a good person. Sin is something that is deep down inside of us. We inherit it. And we are no longer a perfect image of God. We were created to be a perfect image, right? That's how we were created. But unfortunately, when we start to unmask ourselves, when we start to look at ourselves in different ways, no matter how much we put on the outside, deep down, we're dirty. Deep down, we're full of holes. We're torn up. We are evil, no good, God-hating human beings. Because we have inherited sin. And we can't do anything to avoid it. We can't be good enough. We can't do anything. But Pastor Luke, that's not fair. <coughs> Why would God condemn all of mankind because of one idiot's actions? All right? Why would he do that? That's a great question. It's a just question. And I'm going to answer it the best way I know how. Number one, first off, we would probably make the same mistake if we were in Adam's feet. If he didn't have shoes. If we were in Adam's feet, we would have made the same mistake. All right? And here's how I know that. I've been talking about Adamson, Adamson, Adamson. Well, what about Eve? Wasn't she the one who took the first bite? Mm -hmm. She was, but there was a difference between Adam and there was a difference between Eve. Adam, or Eve, was deceived by the serpent and took a bite. Adam was offered the fruit and he took a bite. And I have a feeling that if any of us were in his place, we probably would have done the same thing. But here's the second reason why God condemned all of mankind. And I think it's the best reason. If God can condemn all of mankind due to one man, then surely he can save the world by another. And that's exactly what his plan was. That's exactly what he wanted to do. He was going to send his son to fix what Adam had done. So he did. Our second faith lesson for the night, our first one is sin is a deadly disease. Our second is this, Jesus is the new Adam. Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 3, gives the genealogy of Christ in verses 23 through uh, 28. And I'm going to save you guys the pain of having to listen, listen to me butcher these names of Johanna, Joseph, Mathis, Nahum, Nagai, Mathis. I want to save you guys all of that. But what I want to do is I want to read you the beginning and the ending of this. And keep in mind, there's like 
I don't know, 25 names listed here or more. And it says this, verse 23, as he began his ministry, Jesus was about 30 years old, and he was the thought to be the son of Joseph. And as it continues through this names, it lists he's the son of this, son of this, son of this, son of this. It finally gets down to chapter, or to verse 20, uh, 38, and it says this, son of Enos, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. Luke traced his lineage all the way back from Joseph, his father, all the way back to Adam and Adam's father, who is the God who molded him of the dust of the earth. And this is very important. This is important for us to take notice of because it shows us that Jesus was both God and man. Now, why is that important? It's important because Adam was the headship of man, and when he sinned, he condemned us all, right? But Jesus had the opposite effect. He was not affected by sin whatsoever. Why not? Because of his holiness, because of who he was. As God, he could come down. And here's the important part. This is why his genealogies are so important. He took man upon him. So he added man to himself. And in doing so, he was able to invade man and this sin nature that we are born with. And he was able to infuse his holiness in it so that we could be saved. Because here's the deal. One man condemned us all. And it's one thing to be the God of the universe and come out externally and fix a problem externally. It's another thing to be named, and as Jesus was, to be named son of Adam, the new Adam, and come as a man and fix the problem internally. Because sin is not an external problem. Sin is an internal problem, and Jesus came to fix it. Here's another example, and it comes from the medical field. And I love it. When they are coming up with a cure or a vaccine for, let's say, the flu, what they do is they find somebody who has had the flu and who beat it. They then draw some of their blood and they look for the antibodies in the blood that were able to uh, 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 evolve and attack the virus and kill it. They take those antibodies, they spin them out of the blood, they take them out, they multiply them, they make a vaccine, and then they use that vaccine to give to everybody else so that they can successfully fight the virus. So why did God have to become man? Because he took his holiness. He infused it into man. And when he shed his blood, he could now wash away the sin nature. And just like the blood is used to fix the viruses today, it is his blood that cleanses the virus of sin. Jesus is the cure for sin. And that is our third faith lesson for the night. Number one, sin is a deadly disease. Number two, Jesus is the new Adam. And number three, Jesus is the cure for sin. Romans chapter 5 Verse 15 through 21, Paul repeats himself multiple times. So I'm only going to read 15 through 18 and explain the rest. But it says this, verse 15, But the gift is not like the trespass. For if one man's trespass, the many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift overflowed to the many by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. And the gift is not like the one man's sin, because from one sin came the judgment, resulting in condemnation. But from the trespasses came the gift, resulting in justification. Since by one man trespasses, death uh, reigned through all that one man. However, how much more? Will those who receive the overflowing grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man? Jesus Christ. 
And as I continue to finish reading that, or as you were, would go and read it um, maybe later tonight, you will see it says one man a whole lot, and it can get confusing. But here's what it gets to. Through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and led to death. Through another man, Jesus Christ, we would overcome that and gain so much more. Grace, hope, and justification. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to talk to you guys about issues that most people will say, those are too, that's, that's, that's too far above their head. But I think you guys are smart enough to get these. So we're going to talk about what Jesus does, what Jesus does for us, the process that we go through. And on your handout and on the deal, you can see this, justification, imputation, sanctification, and glorification. I showed this to somebody today, and they said, are you sure they can get that? And I said, I know they can get it. Because these truths are things that you need to learn. And if you can learn them now, they will change your life forever. So let's start. What does Jesus do? He's the cure, right? He died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he saved us. And when we trust in him, the first thing that happens is justification. It is a correction of our sin. It literally means to be declared right in a legal stance. All right? It is a one-time verdict, and it means that our sin is permanently removed. Let me say that again. Jesus died on the cross. He allowed for justification. And when we trust in him, he takes this sin. He rips it off of us and he throws it away forever. And it is gone. And it's no longer there. And we no longer have to worry about it. Because we have been justified. We have been shown right in the eyes of God. And our sin is as far as the east is from the west. That sin can never come back to haunt us because it is gone. God removed it with his death, burial, and resurrection. But here's the deal. I inherited sin, right? It's not tied to the law. So even though I got rid of all of that, I still have my old nature. It needs to be refined. It needs to be moved. So what happens? Well, Jesus came, and he lived. He lived for 33 years. And I always thought that was strange. Why did he live for 33 years? Why didn't he just come and die for us? And the reason is, is because he had to show us that man could be righteous. He had to provide righteousness for us. And when he does that, and we are justified, he then does something called imputation, or to impute his righteousness upon us. And what he does is he takes it, and he literally places it on to us. All right? Literally places it on to us. And so now, not only is our sin permanently removed, but we are covered in his righteousness. And when God looks at us, he no longer sees the ugly sin nature that's underneath here. He only sees the righteousness, the holiness, the grace of his son. All right? That's what justification is. That's what imputation is. Now, the next one on the list is sanctification. All right? Sanctification is the process of becoming like Jesus. Just because he's covered me in his righteousness, he's also going to be working on what's underneath. He's also going to be working on making this whole, making this righteous. And so as we go through life and we face trials, we are asked to put our trust in him. We are asked to deal with a parent's divorce, a dirty breakup. Uh, a dog dying, a parent or grandparent passing away. As we deal with all those things, those are there to help us grow stronger to God. Those are there to help us grow closer to Him. They are to refine us. They are to make us better so that we can become like Jesus. Guys, Jesus didn't have it easy. Adam had it easy and he messed it up. 
Jesus went through a lot and he was still perfect. He was still holy. And now that we have been justified, that his righteousness is upon us, he will begin to work upon us through sanctification for, so that our bodies can be progressively renewed, so that we can transform over time, so that when we get to heaven, when we see Jesus, we will complete our sanctification and enter into glorification. Glorification is exactly that. It is the point when we come to heaven and we are given a new body, a whole body, a clean body, a holy and perfect body that God has granted us. And we are in his presence, living forever. Justification. Imputation. Sanctification. And glorification is the process that we go through as Christians and that God uses to take us from a dirty old rag that has inherited sin to someone who has seen as righteous, as holy, and can enter into the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus does. Now here's the interesting part. Why did Adam bite the fruit? Does anybody know? All right, that's good. His wife gave it to him, but there's a specific reason why they ate it. One more. Close. What was the temptation? Corey. To become like God. That's right. The temptation, you're right, he was tempted. But the temptation was not the fruit. The temptation was that the serpent told him, if you eat this, you will become like God, right? So Adam tried to become like God on his own. He tried to take that from God, and he condemned us all. But Jesus comes back, and what does he do? He makes us like God. He has the opposite. He makes us closer to him. He's taking us back to the way we used to be. Adam tried to be like God. Jesus was God, and he became man. Adam came from the earth. Jesus came from the heavens. Adam was tested in a perfect garden, a utopia, a paradise, where he felt nothing but love and beauty from God himself. Jesus was tempted and tested in the wilderness, in the desert. He was hungry. He was thirsty. And there was nothing but hate and ugliness surrounding him. And yet he was able to succeed. Adam was a thief who tried to take something that wasn't his. And he condemned us all. On the cross, in a fitting he looked over to a thief and he said tonight you will be with me in paradise two things two different outcomes this was God's plan from all along guys from Genesis chapter 3 the moment the fruit was eaten, God showed up and said that I will put enmity or I will put uh, uh, distance and hatred between the serpent and the woman and between her seed and his seed. And her seed will come and crush your head, even though your seed will come and bruise his heel. Jesus is the long-awaited heir, the long-awaited Savior who came to change the world. We deserve death, but he took it for us. He paid the penalty. He came to earth. He put his holiness in human form so that he could rid us of this evil curse called sin. And he died for us. You know, I often wonder, actually I don't wonder because I see it all the time, how you guys would react if someone falsely accused you. And like I said, 
I start to go, hmm, I wonder how they would react. But then I go, wait a minute, I do this all the time. I know exactly how you react. When I come to you and something wrongs happen, most of the time I'll come up and I'll go, hey guys, what happened here? And everybody whose wasn't fault was it does this. They go, whoa, 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 wasn't me, Pastor Luke. I don't know what you're talking about. Or they pull this way. It was that person. Over there, over there. No one wants to accept the guilt for someone else's wrongdoings. But Jesus did. He went on trial. All right? And he never said a word. He was beaten. And he never said a word. He was found. Do you, do you guys know that Pontius Pilate found Jesus innocent? He washed his hands. He said, there is no guilt I can find in this man. I don't know what you guys are talking about. He was still crucified. He still took on our sin. Jesus did it for us. And he didn't sit up on that cross looking down at us. He didn't sit up there and look down and go, hey, I'm innocent. Uh, yeah, this wasn't me. I don't know what's going on. Get me down from here. This is uncomfortable. He didn't sit up there asking those things. He sat up there. He looked down and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is who Jesus is. That is what he has done for you. Guys, we are infected with sin, a deadly disease. But Jesus came as the cure. Have you accepted the cure? Or are you just waiting to die? Let's bow our heads. Here in a moment, I'm going to invite you to our invitation. I'm going to extend an invitation to you. Because maybe you're here tonight, and you're hearing the sin that I'm talking of, and you know exactly, you're like that black shirt that's dirty, full of holes, cut up, and barely making it through the day. And maybe you want to come and meet Jesus so that you can be justified, so that you can have his righteousness imputed upon you, so you can go through sanctification, so that one day you can be glorified. I'm going to be up front. We're going to have leaders all throughout the room. And if that is you tonight, I want to encourage you, invite you to step out. No one will stop you. Step out and go and talk to one of these leaders. And they will gladly share with you how you can come to know Christ. But maybe tonight you've been justified. Maybe tonight you're in the process of sanctification. But you've gone and found that old comfortable shirt and you've put it back on. And you're trying to live life your way. Maybe you need to come forward and confess your sins tonight. I will invite you to do that. But in a moment when the music plays, you guys come. Father God, I thank you so much.